Welcome to this Information Services Today webinar on diversity in the information professions. This webinar addresses content from part one, Information Landscapes, specifically focusing on chapters three and five. This webinar is part of a 10-part webinar series representing the diverse authors of the second edition of my book, Information Services Today, an introduction. As the editor, I am thrilled to be presenting this webinar series in conjunction with my textbook, Information Services Today, an introduction. Hearing directly from the contributing authors as they reflect and share their insight on today's information landscape is a unique opportunity to glean from their expertise, both the opportunities and challenges that lie on the horizon. Authors Heather O'Brien and Devin Grayson from Chapter four, diverse information needs state that information professionals must both zoom in on the individual user and his or her specific problem situation, cognitive and effective state and the end goals, and then zoom out to the level of the group, organization or community to consider the broader expectations, access and resource constraints and emerging technologies that will impact current and future information needs. Part one, information landscapes, cultural and technological influence presents the historical transformations of the information organization while demonstrating how these organizations remain true to their core mission of serving the diverse needs of their community. Part one also highlights the heart of the information organization's existence, the information professional and their innate understanding of community. Chapters three and five from part one are represented in this webinar. Chapter three traces the trends and emerging trends and issues in the profession along multiple dimensions with an emphasis on the value information professionals bring to their communities. This chapter also provides a wealth of resources for information professionals to stay abreast of these trends. Chapter five expands upon the discussion of diversity in the community while addressing critical issues for today's times, such as equity of access and social justice. Of tremendous value to their and to this book are the contributing authors. These authors were specifically chosen for their expertise, passion and commitment, not only to the field of information science, but also to the professional development of tomorrow's information leaders. I would now like to introduce the panel of authors for this webinar. Stephen Abram is a strategy and direction planning consultant for libraries and the information industry as principal of Lighthouse Consulting Incorporated and exec executive director of the Federation of Ontario Public Libraries. He is a library trend watcher, keynote speaker, innovator, and author of Stephen's Lighthouse blog. He is the author of Chapter 3, Librarianship, a Continuously Evolving Profession. Miguel Figueroa is the director of the American Library Association Center for the Future of Libraries. He has previously held positions at the American Theological Library Association, the American Library Association as the director of the Office for Diversity and Spectrum Scholarship Program and the Office for Literacy and Outreach Services. He also worked at the New York University's Langone Medical Center, Ehrman Medical Library, and also at Neil Schumann Publishers. He is co-author of Chapter 5, Diversity, Equity of Access, and, um, and uh, Social Justice. Melissa Cardenas Dow is a social sciences librarian at California State University, Sacramento. Cardenas Dow is also co-chair of the American Library Association's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Implementation, Implementation Working Group and an American Library Association counselor at large. She is also a co-author of Chapter 5, focusing on social justice. There are six key themes for the second edition of Information Services Today, an introduction. Chapters three and five address four of these key themes. These chapters all provide an overall state of the field, beginning with a history of the introduction um, of the information organization and key influencers to forecasting future trends and issues that will require information professionals to remain forward thinking. 
They also address how libraries and information centers will remain valuable entities in their communities. But to thrive, they will need to remain creative, innovative, and technologically advanced. Additionally, they address new competencies, roles, and opportunities for information professionals. And they address challenges and key issues of the, of the field for the, and for the sustainability and essentialness of the information organization. So Stephen, Miguel, and Melissa, what is your interpretation of these themes and how do they specifically relate to your chapter's content? Stephen, let's begin with you. Yes, I, I do believe that this is a, uh, a key aspect of the way librarianship has evolved. When we were just leveraging explicit knowledge, capturing documents of all types and providing access, it just wasn't as important, maybe on the selection level. But as we start to leverage experiential knowledge and communities of practice, diversity is essential. And it's diversity beyond in, but including ethnicity and indigenous knowledge and uh, uh, language, it's diversity of thinking styles and diversity of communication styles and diversity of learning styles. Because the long-term trend in librarianship is towards leveraging collective knowledge and co-creating knowledge with our uh, users, our markets, our, our customers, our members. And that is essential. And one cannot connect on the emotional learning connectedness level that we need if the team in libraries isn't diverse enough to understand uh, differences in languages, perspectives, and point of view. Thank you, Stephen. And Miguel, what are your thoughts? So I think uh, diversity and equity of access are, are two of the essential drivers that help libraries evolve and stay relevant. I, I, I present uh, two of the definitions that we use in, in our chapter. And specifically, the, the definition from the American Association of, I'm sorry, the Association of American Colleges and Universities, all the way from 2005, that definition stays with me because they talk about how it, diversity is looking at composition as an exploration of differences. There's also this underlying interest in opposing those unfair forms of exclusion, prejudice, and discrimination. And they reiterate that diversity is fundamentally about work, very time-consuming and difficult work. I think for libraries and for information professionals, trying to figure out, we have these services and programs, everything from our collection to, to story time to outreach services to consulting services, et cetera. But all of that effort to create this infrastructure is for naught if we don't do an active job of working with our communities and find out, well, how do we make these services and programs relevant to your changing needs, your changing sense of identity, and the changing composition of community? So it's going to be ongoing work throughout that process. Through that work, though, we evolve and iterate and, and perfect those services and programs so that they have continuing importance. And the same can be said for our commitment to equity of access. We're trying to develop with our communities uh, programs and services that are sort of universally available and accessible to them. Um, that sort of ongoing development and appraisal of and engagement with diverse populations allows us to innovate with them and maintain that sort of relevance. So it is fundamental to our work of remaining valuable entities in our community. It is fundamental to how we will develop those new competencies, roles, and opportunities. And I think it also helps us address challenges in the field for the sustainability of our long-term services. If we don't keep an eye towards how we're embracing diverse communities, and if we don't reconfigure our services so they are increasingly equitable and increasingly valuable, I think we hit stumbling blocks that prevent us from working. Thank you so much, Miguel. And Melissa, what do you think? Um, I think Miguel has stated very important points here. And so the theme of social justice um, as a framework is really an extension of diversity and equity. Um, and so we really need to think about um, social justice uh, in terms of the work of organizations as a means of focusing our role as agents of institutions. Our professions are institutions, and so are the organizations that we are employed in. And so we as information professionals function as agents of the information service institution. In that sense, we need to be cognizant of our roles, 
our place and our actions. Um, embracing diversity, inclusion, and equity is just not enough. Um, and um, Miguel had stated this, that this is um, time-consuming work. Um, so celebrating differences isn't enough. Um, and a social justice framework states that our societal terrain is replete with oppression, power, and privilege. So we need to be a, a lot more comfortable um, speaking about these three um, concepts and also to be working on uh, getting more understanding of these three concepts. Um, as information professionals, we need to be versed in these and also the contradictory issues and problems um, our communities face. So here I have um, in this slide, I have um, provided three groupings. The first one is expectations um, that we should have uh, on our information organizations. Um, of ourselves, us asking of our information organizations, but also quite possibly what our communities would be asking. The second um, group is the work to be done by information organizations from the perspectives of information professionals. And the third is specific expectations regarding uh, innovation. And it's important to state innovation less about technology, but increasing relevance to our community's needs. Thank you so much. You've all raised some interesting points about some of the themes that are, have emerged. And so I wonder if there's any further comment any of you would like to make. I'd like to add some stuff that I've learned over the last year in our work in Canada around truth and reconciliation with our Indigenous communities. And uh, we've learned a lot about the diminution of voice and the uh, collection development and other issues around how voices aren't represented in our collections or in our consultations. And so how does one get those voices into a profession that's not uh, full of people of Indigenous heritage? 20 years ago, we established an Indigenous scholarship. So now we've got about 15 or 20 Indigenous librarians who have graduated with MLISs, but that's still us teeny little minority. Uh, so we've started to actually model things we've learned from that community in order to get their voices in. And there's things we can learn around technological change. So the talking stick around the fire is a perfect metaphor for dealing with making sure voices are heard around an electronic forum. And it's a solution from another community. And so if we want to get diversity in our profession, we can't grow it at home. It's a generational change. It's going to take a long time uh, just to be realistic, but we can get those voices in by setting up, uh, be having an awareness of how to make sure the voices inform our uh, institutional and social business strategies. Thank you, Stephen. Melissa and Miguel, did you have anything further you wanted to add? I mean, I think one of the interesting things about uh, these chapters, looking at them together, is that um, libraries are, as Stephen's chapter kind of puts it, puts in frame, we are an ev evolving profession and an evolving set of institutions. I think kind of the work through that we need to do is evidenced by what Stephen just suggested is, as our aspirations evolve from just collecting things to really looking at what's the collective knowledge of us, of society and how do we make that 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 more available and how do we create those connections around knowledge that diversity and equity help us do that in many of the ways that, that Stephen articulated, that it brings new perspectives into the work that we do, both uh, uh, technologically focused, but also focused on human connection. And our ultimate throughput, the thing that we want to see is the social justice push that uh, Melissa says, we're not providing knowledge just to provide knowledge, we're providing knowledge to improve people's lives, to create a more leveled playing field, a more cooperative playing field in which all of us succeed and thrive. And so those things kind of sync up together in a very nice way. Thank you very much. Why don't we move on now? Um, let's now direct our attention to today's information landscape.
The first edition of this book came out three years ago, and as we all know, the field of library and information science has been in constant flux. So what are some of the key changes as they relate to your chapter's topic that have occurred over the last three years? So Stephen, we'll start with you. Uh, I, I think there's two things we need to watch that are just emerging and uh, no one quite understands them yet. 10, 15 years ago, the University of Arizona Information School did a lot of research on automatic summarization of books and articles and successfully was able to uh, not only pull all the information out of a book, but also uh, set it up to turn into a book writing thing. Now we've got artificial intelligence and machine learning. So we've already got successful things out there of machines that can read. They can read for understanding and they can read for comprehension. We need to understand what humans do. So we may comprehend, but we do things for insight. So since our collections, and just delving back into the theme of this uh, webinar, are largely the output of Western society and uh, uh, power-structured Western society, it is incumbent on librarians to get those other uh, voices and writings into it to uh, survive the weight of the mass of uh, traditional knowledge. I'm not denigrating uh, the traditional knowledge of Western society. I am denigrating the lack of uh, real diversity in the voices there, whether it's black authors, indigenous authors, immigrant stories, people who didn't have in the past access to the means of publishing and the power to get it released. So when we look at technology coming in and the artificial intelligence, machine reading, machine learning, we need to be careful that as it moves from comprehension to insight, that it's not merely a, a traditional Western dominated point of view, that it takes into account the language differences in what people mean when they use different language from different cultures and different uh, histories and legacies. And I think that that's a really interesting part of uh, how, how we uh, start to comment on the social justice issues within technology development. Thank you so much, Stephen. Miguel, what do you think? Well, I mean, I think one of the interesting things with diversity and, and why I think it's uh, uh, something that's uh, of interest to the profession is that it, it taps into our curiosity in a lot of ways. Um, since the since the first edition of, of the book, and I think, you know, even since I started writing this chapter with, with Patty Wong and with Melissa, um, human sense of who we are as individuals, our collective identities, those are all ideas that are constantly in flux and constantly changing. And we continue to look at new systems through different perspectives. Um, traditionally, we think of diversity in terms of categories of race or ethnicity, sexual orientation, gender, physical abilities, and age. But we all know that we bring a a multitudinous mix of other perspectives to that, and sometimes overlapping perspectives as well. And so we do need to look at those types of things. As Stephen talks about technology systems that evolve, we also have to think about how society itself is evolving to reconsider how it's organized and, and how it looks at, at the world. Um, I think since the first edition, we've also started to see within our own profession an increasing interest and appreciation for our opportunities to look out and engage with other communities and ask them in very real in real terms what their aspirations are, not for the future of libraries, but for the future of society, for the future of their individual community. And so we started to see initiatives like the Aspen Institute Dialogue on Public Libraries, ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities Program, and even the Harwood Institute uh, for Public Innovation and our partnership around that, and some of the work that I'm doing, the Center for the Future of Libraries, and say, okay, what's happening outside of us that can help us better Better understand what our possible futures might be. Um, even if artificial intelligence makes it easier to, to digest information and, and re-expose it, it's going to be up to library professionals and information professionals to synthesize that information with the larger aspirations, the difficult questions that humans pose uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. Thank you, Miguel. 
and Melissa. All right, I think um, today's information landscape really focuses on this shift from collections to community or uh, better yet, people. And as communities are not themselves like a level playing field, there's a lot of contradictions and a lot of clashing going on. Um, we do see this um, emphasis of like from receiving to creating, like a lot of programs in many libraries where um, we are helping our communities to gain voices, right? And um, we as information um, cultural institutions, we uh, provide the services so that such creation is made available to many. And as Stephen had mentioned previously, um, you know, these are like the holes, the missing um, pieces that are often um, have gone unexamined or unheard. Um, so we're also facing in terms of like information, the information landscape of um, scarcity where we have um, not a whole lot of information resources to a situation of glut. So we have to help our communities um, make assessments of, of different information sources. Um, and that's where social justice comes in because it's important for us to think of access to information as a means of um, providing uh, needed services, social services. So therefore it is a social justice, justice issue. Thank you so much. So you all have raised some interesting um, changes that have happened over the past uh, few, couple years. I wonder if there's any further thoughts that you have on this topic um, around uh, kind of the evolution and it's kind of the changes that are happening in the field. Sandy, I think one of the most interesting uh, aspects of this is uh, we're already seeing the beginning of it with uh, David Lanky's speech on uh, promoting that we're not neutral. And I think uh, not being neutral as a profession is different than being uh, uh, plainly just an, a player who doesn't have an opinion. We are biased, but I used to say we're biased towards quality, but now that's not good because we start to recognize that our idea of quality is quite different. So as we see the promotion of within Facebook and Twitter of filters that detect bias, and you can set them to, uh, not, to not show you things that are on a macro level, conservative or liberal or whatever, uh, those are highly inherently risk, risk, riskful. They're, uh, they, can, they have the ability to remove voices. So if we were back in 1865, slave rebellions would have been considered uh, crazy town and their voice could have been cut off. So, you know, change happens from the unreasonable person and the unreasonable person drives change and, the, and, and that bias could be lost. So we need to be very careful that uh, the voices of people who are incurring change, whether it's in the Me Too debate or whatever, how do we make sure that uh, um, the stories are put on a scale, they're not in black and white, that the full discussion happens and we respect the tradition of intellectual freedom within our field while still protecting our right to an individual opinion. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, um, Melissa or Miguel, did you have anything further? Um, I just wanted to complicate this um, already complicated landscape that Stephen had um, painted for us. And that is by throwing there the question that we should all be asking as information professionals, as remember agents of the in, um, information organization, information institution. So that question would be, how do I uphold and dismantle oppression? And um, we cannot really ask ourselves these quest this question without having a better handle on the concepts of oppression, power, and privilege. So that's very significant. 
um, another thing too is like when we're asking this question of ourselves, we are focusing on this highly um, contradictory nature. Like how do we uphold intellectual freedom while also upholding those marginalized voices. So oftentimes, you know, in, in just in the practicality of things, one often uh, wins over the other. So asking this very difficult question is important for us to do. Thank you so much, Melissa. Yes, it, there's a lot of complexity to this discussion. But why don't we move on to um, direct our attention now to the future. So what trends or emerging issues will impact the field of library and information science as it relates to your chapter's topic? So Stephen, we'll start with you. Uh, I love the trend of uh, Alexa, uh, Hello Google, these devices. So I've got a few clients who are bringing, are buying all of them because they're less than $100 and doing programming on it and using it to, you know, compete with a librarian, do a, a trivia night in the local craft brewery with Alexa and a team of librarians. Uh, it's a way of marketing the library, but that technology and the internet of things and the book as a thing and the ability for Alexa to read a book and tell you a summary in seconds is going to fundamentally shift the, the world of our profession. And I don't think it's about the fiction world of our profession, not the end to end romance of reading a book. This is about the nonfiction world. As we move away from uh, uh, nonfiction not being to an end to end pleasure, it's a jump in, jump out from the index and get a couple of uh, key pieces of advice and, and combine it with video, Alexa has the ability to do that faster and in a different way. And what is the role of a librarian? Are we really teaching digital literacies and not information literacies now? Are we teaching how to craft a good question? Uh, how do we need to evolve in a world where I can just talk out loud in my living room and ask a question and get, you know, whether the actor I'm seeing on that movie is dead yet, as a reference question versus uh, how, when Alexa's telling me step-by-step step how to make a muffin. Um, it's pretty amazing. And I think that's going to challenge us with these three or four devices that are on the market for 59 bucks. Thank you, Stephen. Miguel, what do you think? The broad charge of our profession, you know, information and knowledge, as Stephen kind of demonstrates, gives us broad license to look at lots of different technologies and emerging trends, voice control, the internet of things, and recognize how that fits into the work that we do. Um, I'm kind of a big proponent of, I, th I think it's John Barry from Library Journal who used to say every issue can be a library issue. I tend to believe that a lot of trends, every trend can be a library trend. I think the challenge though is that we have to connect those trends that are happening in the larger world to a set of guiding values and principles that have helped our profession steer towards productive futures for generations. And so if we look at Alexa or any one of the number of voice controls, if we look at virtual reality, we need to identify how that fits into our continuous missions towards literacy, towards intellectual freedom, towards creation and expression, education, public discourse, service, any one of a number of things. Um, people sometimes ask me, well, why isn't diversity a trend or some, why isn't equity of access a trend that we're following? And I would argue that it really isn't a trend. It's a way that we look at the larger world that we're in. And so trends only exist as they relate to people. So we have to ask ourselves as we look at specific trends, Alexa, you know, how does that, how does diversity play into that? And it's everything from uh, people's accents to the, the digital divide of how, how many people can afford those hundred or $59 devices and the Wi-Fi that enables them or the smartphone that they need to do that. And all of those start to come together and we start to realize that we have to look at a trend and evaluate it through our value of diversity, through our value and commitment to equity of access, and then realize what role the library information professional can play in that, in that future trend. Thank you, Miguel and Melissa. Um, similar to Miguel, I do think that asking questions regarding 
uh, power, oppression, and um, social justice are significant. It's it's underlying all these other trends that are currently happening. So, um, just a trend wise, I think um, as we're seeing right now that those types of questions are being asked, and I really think that, and and I hope that we will continue to ask them and also um, try to work towards change. So here I have the slide that says, Power doesn't belong to any one person, but exists in the relationships between people. I think that's very significant. And if we um, ascribe that as part of how we conceive of diversity as the undergirding um, issue, like how we frame the world when we look at the world of information and the trends and te the technological trends that are currently happening, then we will also be incorporating a social justice framework that uh, takes a look and asks questions about power and oppression, who is being left behind and why. And I think, uh, as Miguel had already said, these are the types of things that we should be asking of um, these technological changes and even like the programmatic changes that we're seeing in information organizations. Thank you very much, Melissa. And I uh, wanted to open up for any further discussion or comment uh, from any of you. Would you like to add anything? I'd, I'd just add one thing because it's counterintuitive. Uh, the role of access. Sometimes people think having a device is access. And we've just done a major study in all sizes of libraries in Southern Ontario. And so we know, we always knew that uh, the lower your income, uh, the more you were a visible minority, the more likely you were to have a smartphone. What we didn't understand until we started doing the survey was access to peripherals, scanners, printers, uh, the ability to use specialized software, that's where the access issue has moved and the ability to have broadband at home versus Starbucks or the library. So we're starting to see a shift in how we need to play out this equity of access story at the same time as recognizing as Finland has done or some of the Scandinavian countries have done that access is a fundamental human right, but equity builds on access. It isn't providing equity to have access. And that's a, a big shift that libraries need to start playing well in to ask those questions. I'm also waiting for us to start publishing the articles on Alexa and Hey Google and whatever on, uh, no, you've seen some odd things lately, but it needs to be done in a proper uh, academic study on how racist they are, on how, uh, they say things that are funny in the moment, maybe, but offensive in the long term. And I think we need to start calling out the digital bodies on that. Thank you, Stephen. Melissa or Miguel, anything further on this? I mean, I think one of the things around trends is, as evidenced by this conversation that we're having, we all bring a different perspective to considering the importance of different changes that are happening in our world. And that's really important uh, for, for framing uh, our understanding of how the world and future will evolve. We have to engage in these sort of dialogues around things. I think also one of the things that I appreciate about, about what Stephen shared is that um, there will be both a defensive positioning that sometimes we can adopt around some of these uh, values, uh, around some of these trends, you know, concern about the, the, the um, inherent bias of some of them or, or something else. But at the same time, we also have to think with the multiple lenses that we have as library professionals and say, they could also help democratize it information or create greater pathways to knowledge or something else. And that's certainly a library value. So many of these things are going to be in tension, and we have to be willing to move with that tension and develop a certain amount of comfort and recognize the ways in which we might be able to exploit some of these trends to our greater benefit, and at the same time, some of the ways that we might develop defensive, defensiveness or proactively move societies around some of the more problematic elements of these trends. Living in tension is going to be increasingly be part of our, our professional lives. And I'll just add very quickly, uh, the best metaphor I heard on that, when cars were the same age as this technological world we're living in now, 
they didn't have windshields that didn't that were glass that would break they didn't have airbags they didn't have seat belts so there are mechanisms that we can put in that can have a bias towards quality and safety that don't interfere with your enjoyment of the car the same way they can be put into things if we find our voice and provide it on an international forum. Thank you. Um, that's a really good discussion. I feel like we could spend a lot more time talking about that, but we'll, um, we'll move on to the next topic. So we've uh, addressed the changes of the past few years, and the challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. Uh, at the core of the information landscape are the people who work in these organizations, providing services to the communities that they serve. This leads us to focus on today's information professional. So what advice do you have for the new information professional to meet the needs of tomorrow's information landscape? And based on your area of expertise, what are some of the, core, um, some of the key competencies information professionals will need to succeed in meeting the needs of the communities and the organizations that they serve? So Stephen, we'll start with you. And I just want to say it's uh, Sandy's structure that puts me up first every time. <laughs> it's, it's not that we aren't dividing it up. <laughs> and uh, I think that uh, this is an interviewing process for any stage of libraries. I look for people who have an ability to play. And I think the ability to play with new technologies uh, and how you play with them, how open-minded you are. Uh, if I know somebody's playing Pokemon Go, and they're open-minded and they are understanding that suddenly artificial reality, a game and GPS are being combined and they're able to make that leap that libraries and librarians are at desks in buildings is a GIS indicator that we need our locations and personal contact in addition to digital. And that is where play transitions into an open mind. So I'm looking for what are the things that cause an open mind? What is the diversity that you see in your friend networks and your uh, colleagues? And are you listening to other voices? So I travel regularly to indigenous communities. I travel regularly to small towns. Uh, my wife and I support three refugee families. So I can see in my personal life that I get enjoyment and power and hear things I would never hear and that's what I look for in an emerging information professional. Are they doing the things that uh, keeps them open to uh, new evolutions as, as they evolve in our profession? Thank you so much, Stephen. Miguel? So my, I know that what, what, what brought me to this information professional, why I wanted to work in libraries, uh, uh, why I believe that was because I was that person who tended to have a certain amount of curiosity, who liked to formulate questions, who liked to get leads on the answers by surveying diverse sources of literature and other types of things. Um, so I always think that part of the advice that I would encourage for new profession, information professionals is to continue to develop that curiosity. Um, I often point to, to this idea that the future is defined by those who understand the larger context in which they operate. And I think for libraries, that's very much true. I, the, the innovators and the leaders in our profession that I admire the most are the ones who constantly look outside of our buildings, outside of our regular practice, and say, well, what does this piece of information mean for our future? How do I contextualize something that's happening in an entirely different sector and make it meaningful towards the work that I'm doing? That sort of playfulness, I think, that what's, what Stephen was kind of alluding to, I think that that's entirely true. Um, we have a good degree of flexibility to make information and knowledge more accessible to people. Um, on the diversity and, and equity of access side, you know, I often go back to this book, The Wisdom of Crowds, and I always appreciate its articulation of why diversity is important. They say that it helps because it actually adds perspectives that would otherwise be absent and because it takes away or at least weakens some of the destructive characteristics of group decision making. You know, we have collections of books that are all different types because we know that there is not one single authoritative answer or source that people benefit from putting different ideas together. 
together. In much the same way, I think that's what new professionals need to have that skill in doing is saying, okay, how do I put lots of different perspectives together to make my work more meaningful? And constantly doing that by going back to communities and different people and asking them, how do you see the library? How do we make it more relevant to you? Helps us achieve that future. So curiosity and this value for deep level of diversity and engagement, I think are two of the values that are most important. Thank you so much, Miguel and Melissa. Okay, so the big thing that I think is really important, while I do think that cultural competency is, is great and we should actually uh, seek to improve ourselves in, in our competence, I really think that it's important to shift our frame of mind instead of cultural competency, using cultural humility. We have a lot to learn in um, uh, the field of social work as like, you know, a, a social service profession. So this idea of cultural humility came from that. Um, a trend that I've been seeing uh, lately is that the Office for Diversity, Literacy, and outreach services of the American Library Association has been giving trainings and webinars on the significance of cultural humility. And this table right here that I had provided comes from an article written by Fish, uh, Fisher, Born, Kane, and Martin that is called uh, From Mastery to Accountability, Cultural Humility as an Alternative to Cultural Competence. And that's something I think is, is very important. Um, it goes in line with our um, thinking of uh, lifelong learning and, and self-reflectiveness and critical thinking. So I think that's something that is important for us to, to consider as information professionals, especially when we uh, say that we have a commitment to social justice and diversity and equity. Thank you so much. So I think you all raised um, some really uh, interesting things that will be important for information professionals to develop. I wonder how you would suggest that uh, information professionals uh, uh, develop some of these competencies or skills, uh, such as uh, cultural uh, humility or um, some of the like being open, the broad being open and curious. What do you have any suggestions or ideas about ways that people might be able to achieve um, to acquire these abilities? I think a lot of it has to do with a certain amount of uh, internal consideration, um, trying to figure out those uh, experiences that the experiences that you have had outside of yourself as a library or information professional, what do those add or contribute to your work as a professional? I think sometimes, especially for new and, and young professionals, we go into our uh, first professional position uh, touting our knowledge of reference work or um, user-centered design or something else that we've acquired through school or somewhere else. And we sometimes fail to inventory and understand that we also come to these professional positions as uniquely diverse people, as you know, a first-generation college graduate or as someone who is racially and ethnically diverse, or perhaps we have an immigrant history in, in, in who we are that those are unique perspectives that we have to add to this conversation. Um, and those also help us start to understand that there are areas in which we are not expert in uh, how people approach libraries and information centers, that we recognize only certain dimensions of who we are and we look at things only through certain lenses and perspectives, that it is not the totality of everything that we have. And it is entirely acceptable that we will never have the full framework to look through. We need other people. We need to have a certain amount of comfort with our deficiencies uh, in order to achieve full, uh, full contribution to society. Thank you, Miguel. Melissa or Stephen, did you have anything further? Yeah. Um, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Melissa. All right. So I just wanted to like um, go uh, and re 
like really support what Miguel had said because it's really important like as um, a public services librarian we always bring our identities right to to our services so when we are there at the reference desk we are we bring who we are but at the same time when you're at the service desk I do want people to also keep in mind of who you are and in what position you are so your patron comes to you um, may or might not see the identity that you have as maybe a first generation um, uh, professional or um, uh, someone who is maybe a, of a particular race that type of thing you are always going to be an agent of that institution so that is also an identity that you carry so um, oppression and power will always be relational. So within that dynamic of the reference desk, you are still behind that desk. So you still have um, a position of privilege. So that is something that we have to also keep in mind. Um, there are uh, programs and, and trainings and services that are being provided by um, the Office for Diversity, Literacy, Outreach Services of ALA. Um, also, you know, our colleagues uh, are, are, are always available for um, just talking these things through because I really do believe that it's important for um, information professionals to be critical and self-reflective. Um, so I also want to put a plug out there. There is a movement called Whole Person Librarianship, which uh, takes these questions and tries to put them in within the context of um, information professionals as social services uh, providers of social services. So um, in addition to these individualized identities that we do have as, as um, private citizens, private people, we are still agents of the institutions that employ us and so that context of um, how we provide services and um, how we can mitigate oppression and privilege within the larger context of society becomes important thank you and Stephen, did you have something yeah, additional just a quick thing i i think we uh in the uh context of humility which i think is a, a perfect word for this I'm, uh, you know, we can say it, I am uh, a visual image of some of the problem. <laughs> and as one pulls back, I pull back from my keynoting, but I also sit on a number of conference boards for uh, of conference planning committees for over 25 years. Uh, 20 years ago, we said, okay, there's certain role models missing. Young librarians aren't being seen on these panels. Librarians of color aren't being seen on these panels women aren't being seen on the panels. We were getting highly criticized for three white guys in a row who were old. And you know, it, that's got its own racism in it, but it was racism in the lack of balance, not that their voices shouldn't be heard. So we put people into uh, a subtle program to say, why do we have to ask 20 women to get one to go on a panel? Or why do, we, why do we have so much trouble finding someone of color? Or some, and why do we have issues in our audience when they hear someone speak with an accent, even though they're brilliant? So we just got to get them up there more often so that people get used to this. It works in IFLA. Why can't it work in the United States or Canada? So if we get more role models on the conference circuit, if we get them showing that they're talented and bright and are uh, huge contributors to the profession, that starts to create a very different dynamic. It also puts them on the path to climb the ladder into the leadership position so that our leadership and directors and whatever become more diverse as well. And they bring different thinking styles like the youth in particular, female and male. So I think that we need to be, we need to do conscious coupling of people into our programs I use the phrase in humor, not as a slight against Gwyneth. But uh, I think there's an opportunity here to really think about, you know, making sure that all voices are heard in the panel, including some of the staid old guy voices, but have them get into debates and uh, talking and as we develop uh, the future of librarianship so that they're not just good for today, they're good for tomorrow too. 
Thank you so much. It's really good ideas and uh, advice. So uh, I'd like to now uh, thank uh, Stephen Abram, Miguel Figueroa, and Mel Melissa Cardina Stau for joining us today in this webinar on diversity in the information professions. I am very grateful for their insights and their advice um, that they shared in and also for their contribution to information services today and introduction. To the listener, thank you for joining us and I hope you gained a deeper understanding of the changes, challenges, and opportunities within the field of information science. For more information, please check out the additional materials that are available to you via the online supplements and thank you again.